much of the discussion regarding games often invokes the nature of their interactivity. It's no walk in the park then, but I think these are all problems worth solving because games are the only major storytelling medium that has interactivity. Which all kinds of artistic expression involve some interaction with the source material, but is the physical interaction in gaming of some kind of qualitatively disqualifying kind? Video games have certainly a lot of growing up to do in that regard when it comes to delivering dialogue and exposition through the non-interactive. But what video games do, which films and books can never, is of course deliver exposition through the interactive. In my mind, this is where we start to get into the really cool stuff. Video games bring in new vectors for interaction and communication, basically new forms of language that merge the capabilities of other mediums. What does this mean, though? What do you get by digging a little deeper? Let's find out. The act of designing a game can be thought of as creating responses to the actions of a player, about providing information that will sustain the ongoing dialogue between player and game. A simple way of visualizing this model might be, by the way, this diagram and all the diagrams that follow are taken from The Aesthetic of Play, a book that I highly recommend. In this model, interaction is a simple back and forth between the player and the game. The player presses a button, the controller sends a signal, the game receives the signal and updates the screen, providing the player new information in order for the cycle to begin again. To make the case for why we need to expand on this model, I want to show you this bit from a doc given by Brian Upton, writer of The Aesthetic of Play and lead designer of the first Rainbow Six and Ghost Recon. We came to think that interactivity was what games were, that that was somehow fundamental to the essence of games, and that the more interactive a game is, the better it is. And there's a problem with that, and that is can be re revealed in this, when you see gameplay situations like this. If you play a good game of chess, you may ha have two or three minutes, five minutes, if you're playing by mail, you may have days where there is no meaningful interaction that's happening. The play of chess happens when you're staring at the board and thinking. The actual interactions in chess are bookkeeping. In his book, Brian builds on this idea, breaking down the monolithic representation of the game into two subcomponents. To explain this, I'm going to quote the aesthetic of play directly. The constraints determine which moves are permitted. The state is an evolving record of the player's movement within the system. The constraints are fixed, the state is fluid. The player exists within a game as a collection of numbers, a set of values to abstract away their existence within this virtual world. Once you strip away the lighting, the colors, the models, the game can be seen for what its designers have crafted it to be, a system of rules where each element exists in order to structure the experience of the player in some way. Upton contends, however, that a game is more than the intent of its creators. He goes on to write, A game isn't just a system of rules considered in isolation. It is also the pattern of movement that emerges within the play field that the rules define. In saying this, I think Brian has hit upon something really significant. It's common when analyzing media to draw a line between the text and the reader. For some mediums like movies and books, this distinction has become so ubiquitous that, in most analyses, you rarely, if ever, are made to understand what the place of the audience is within the bigger picture. Games, however, blur this line to a degree. A game is not complete without someone to play it, and the act of play carries with it an intrinsic feeling of motion. It is this sensation of movement that I believe Chris Franklin is in part describing in his video Kinesthetics. I press jump, the character model rises, an animation plays, and the sequence is complete. Or is it? More has changed than just the signifiers you see on screen. When in the air, the player is now subject to an ever so slightly different set of constraints, like being unable to jump again, unless your game is awesome and you have a double jump, forcing the player to take stock of these new constraints before they can decide on their next course of action. This alteration of rules is critical to the player's experience of the game. And this shift happens in two places, once within the game, and once within the cognitive framework the player has created to understand the game. In both places, it leaves behind a new set of possibilities, a new horizon for the player to see, starting the process all over again. So, let's update that diagram in order to account for what we now know. Constraints can be further divided into categories of constraints that are currently active and constraints that could become active in the future.
Something else to consider is in learning how to play a game. A player slowly takes the constraints presented by the game and internalizes them, allowing them to respond to future instances of that constraint by using their own internal understanding and anticipation of how the game works, rather than using the cues the game provides. The shift in constraints from being imposed externally to existing internally can be represented by another update to that diagram. From this diagram, it starts to become clear that the arbitrary distinctions that we draw between player and game, for the purpose of analysis, are just that, arbitrary. What we traditionally consider to be separate entities are in fact overlapping and connected to each other, creating what we so mundanely describe as the game in this mutual shared space, where software and human intent can interact to create deep and meaningful experiences. With all this talk about movement, we've yet to describe the space within which it takes place. Upton has a solution for this, and borrows a concept from mathematics called the phase space. For those of you unfamiliar with this idea, which should be most of us because math is just wizardry, here's a nice simplified explanation Brian uses in his book. A phase space is a hypothetical space, representing all possible states of a system, such that any particular state corresponds to a unique location within that space. Think of a graph with two axes. Say one axis stood for position and the other for velocity. What you've got would resemble the phase space for a really basic platform. As the player changes their position and velocity as they move from point to point in the game, the position in this space that they occupy is constantly changing. While it would be impossible to chart out all the variables for a real game into a graph like this one, the advantage of this perspective is that now we can visualize every quantity that varies during a game as movement from one location to another. As humans, we have both a learned and an instinctual understanding of the mechanics of movement. And by adopting this metaphor, this external constraint if you want to get meta, we can reduce the problem to what looks like this. And I'll come back to this in a minute, but something to note is that this is Brian Upton's vision of a typical face space, and he worked on tactical level based games that had definite starting and ending points. In and of itself, this concept isn't something new to game design. Will Wright expresses a similar idea in this talk recorded in 2003. In the game industry, it's kind of important to realize, and it's not immediately obvious, that you're really programming two different processors. Um, there's the computer in front of you with its processor that you're programming in some symbolic computer language. That's kind of the technology side. But the other processor that's even more difficult to program and that the game really is happening in is the player's mind, the player's imagination. And that's, for me, games are about half psychology, half technology. And it's the balance between the two that's really essential to making a good game. Um, and another way to look at this is that players in these games are actually exploring a possibility space. There are all these different branches they can take through this possibility space, and you really want that space to be interesting and varied. Uh, the larger, more open-ended games tend to be the ones where the players feel more freedom, and they feel like what they're doing matters more. It's not everybody being channeled into one solution to the problem. Because in some sense, a game is just a set of problems. You know, we're actually selling you problems for $40. You'll note the differences between the types of spaces presented by the two designers. Will Wright's desired possibility space is much more open and omnidirectional, and you can see that reflected in the types of games he makes, sandboxes like The Sims and Spore. In either case though, when certain states within the phase space, certain locations can be considered more favorable or desirable to you than others, this provides the player with goals, giving them a direction to move towards within the possibility space of the game. Once the player has goals to direct them to a point within the phase space, they must now consider what states to traverse in order to get there, what positions to move through in order to reach their destination. Upton calls this envelope of possibilities that surrounds the player at every point the horizon of action. And because the actions available to the player at any point are influenced by the active external constraints at that point, as the player moves through the level, encountering different constraints, the horizon of action shifts and changes. At any moment, the player is offered a new vista of actions and outcomes, and their next state is defined on the basis of their actions in response. This new state defines a new horizon, and the cycle of gameplay continues. There's another type of horizon that exists within the phase space, but if the horizon of action describes the set of states the player can get to, this horizon encompasses the set of states the player knows they can traverse to, as well as being desirable states for the future. This is called the horizon of intent. The difference between the two is that the horizon of intent is defined by the player's internal constraints, and is a product of the game as understood, whereas the horizon of action is defined by the game's external constraints, and is a product of the game as encountered. According to Upton, 
The ideal scenario for a game is when these two horizons overlap only marginally. This might seem counterintuitive, but in order for a play space to be successful, the player must have some degree of uncertainty as to the outcomes of their actions. A game of poker where everyone knows what the next card is, is no game of poker at all. Okay, so I've bored you with all this talk about game design, but why ultimately should you care? What makes this method of thinking more useful than any of the other schools of game design that you might encounter? Optin has an answer for this too, and it's a problem that I've bumped into the fringes of in my time learning about game design, but never quite managed to put my finger on until I read his book. The problem that I have with a lot of game design methodologies is that they attempt to impose grand scale structures ontologically onto the action of play, and then seem to work their way down. This results in answers that seem to hold up at first blush and broad scales, but then fall apart once you try to apply them practically. Put another way, I've never read a book on game design up until the aesthetic play that felt like I finished it with more answers than questions. The difference with using the idea of constraints and horizons is that they allow you to narrow your focus to the point within the face space that most concerns you. Your game might have a million billion different states, but if you are only ever looking at the horizons of intent and action, you only ever have to consider maybe a dozen of those simultaneously. I'm going to quote Upton for a parting statement before we move on. If we are interested in analyzing gameplay, these two horizons give us a way to talk about the moment-to-moment -moment texture of the encounter, while allowing us to ignore huge chunks of the play space that don't affect a player's immediate experience. In the next section, I'm going to talk about Torment Tides of Humanera and analyze it using the concepts we've talked about so far. Torment Tides of Numenera is the spiritual successor to Planescape Torment, a game that I hold amongst my favorites, and, in my opinion, a game whose legacy lives on today, if in somewhat rocky condition. Let's find out how. In Tides of Numenera, the thing that I find most remarkable is the dedication to creating an experience that constantly forces you to reevaluate your relationship to the rest of the world. Though this is a facet of RPGs in general, and the lineage of this title in particular, I've rarely seen a game so committed to exploring it in its systems. A mechanical throughline you can find is that the game rewards you for playing a consistent character. I'm going to use the example of three systems to illustrate that. First, the dominant tide system. Tides eschews the traditional D&D alignment chart seen in Planescape for a system that uses the spectrum of color instead. If the tides are meant to be constraints on the player, the rule they define can be stated as, your actions shape who you are not your motivations. As you perform actions that align to a certain color, you also shift your character towards that side of the spectrum, changing your dominant tide. Named somewhat confusingly, the eponymous tides in Tides of Numenera are an invisible, ineffable force that is as fundamental to this universe as gravity is to ours, shaping and influencing events all throughout the course of the game, which, in concrete terms, does translate to giving the game designers and writers an out for an ex machina every now and then but they show restraint with this, which is good. An issue I had with this system is that while it definitely feels different from the alignment system used in Planescape, and helps sell the sense of ambiguous morality that seems to characterize the Numenera setting as a whole, it still didn't feel like the tide you belong to had a huge impact when it came to gameplay, whereas in Planescape, the alignment you belong to could affect what faction you could join or items you could use. In truth, it also kind of feels like the developers had bigger plans for this mechanic and how it would be used in-game during their original Kickstarter campaign, as it features rather prominently in their promotional material and design goals, but then down the line realized that it would add a ton of complexity that they didn't have time for, so they decided to simplify it. The end result of this is a set of constraints that do not feel like they shape your current state in any way, or provide opportunities to get to new states, causing an odd disconnect between the gameplay and the narrative. Something I want to do after watching Joseph Anderson and Matthew Matosis' videos is to not just offer criticism, but also potential solutions. Not out of some vain belief that my ideas are in any way better than something the developers could come up with, but to hopefully provide some additional context to existing issues within the game. Tides already has the roots of this idea about how different people and objects are dominated by different tides based on their characteristics. So what might have been interesting would have been to formalize these associations. Characters, items, and maybe even places could have their own clearly visible dominant tides, which would also sell the aspect of how the tides are this force that is omnipresent in this world, and that the player is connected to them. 
and based on the dominant tides of the player, they might be capable of befriending people of certain tides easier. Or there might be items that require their user to belong to a certain tide, or doorways and shortcuts that might open up to the player based on this. What's funny is that this is basically exactly what Planescape did 20 years ago, so I was really confused as to why they would have given up on this aspect of the mechanic, as it worked pretty well the first time. This was really bugging me when I was writing the script, so in order to get some answers, I messaged Adam Hines, design lead of Tides, on Twitter, and asked him whether he had ever planned for the mechanic to be more than it was at launch, and this is what he had to say. So I guess for now, we can only ever imagine what the game would have been like if they'd gotten more time to make it work, and hope for a sequel. Another place where Tides diverges from the D&D formula is in the system it uses for skill checks. Where Planescape would hide or reveal dialogue options to you based on your attributes, Tides takes a more transparent approach, where the player is allowed to see all the options that they have in any given dialogue, but must roll for these options in order for them to succeed. The player can spend points from their stat pools to improve the chances of a successful dice roll, even up to 100%, meaning that you can actually guarantee beforehand whether or not a dice roll will be successful, a fact that I think is either going to sound really bad or really good and nothing in between. You can rest or use items to restore these points. This system is interesting to me, because I can see what it's trying to do, which is to take the classic fighter rogue mage class system and adapt it towards a more narrative focused experience where every encounter, every skill check, combat focused or not, is something the player can roll for. Which, if you think about it, is actually closer to the tabletop role-playing experience than the systems that a lot of games have created in order to simulate those rules. On one hand, I think this mechanic does meet its objective of pivoting a rule set that was originally based around combat encounters and dungeon crawling, and shift that focus to one where every interaction becomes something of an encounter, with each class having its own solution. In short, as a role-playing mechanic, it definitely does the job. But there are some issues that can't be glossed over. It's my opinion that by making all your available options visible to you from the start, there is no longer that element of mystery about what improving different facets of your character could lead to in conversation. By comparison, this system feels a lot more straightforward, making it obvious to the player that the more they invest in a skill tree, the more that skill tree will be useful in the future, a simple linear relationship. However, as you invest more points into the stat pool for any given skill tree, towards the end of the game, it becomes possible to trivialize some of the skill checks, as you are always guaranteed to have enough points. Though I guess whether this is a design issue or a balancing issue could be a matter of debate. The stat pools you possess are the constraints here. They define whether or not the player can progress to their desired states. By comparison in Planescape, your player attributes were your constraints. But where Planescape used to hide certain states from you, and access to those states was a binary pass or fail, in Tides, all these states are visible to you from the start. But there is still a chance of you failing to access them. It's an odd kind of balance, but there it is. Where problem solving in Planescape typically used to involve talking to a bunch of characters and ferrying items back and forth, leading to what were essentially fetch quests with fantastic writing, problem solving in Tides feels more like actual problem solving where challenges are self-contained puzzles that have their own unique solutions. You encounter a locked door with an electronic panel, and you might force it open with might, pick the lock with speed, or hack the panel with intellect. This means that while most obstacles only really have two states, either solved or unsolved, with a few multi-stage puzzle exceptions seen late in the game, when it seems like they had gained more familiarity with designing these systems. I still think that this system has room for improvement, perhaps by requiring the player to make use of the resources that they pick up in the world, or requiring special skill or item usage in order to make the puzzle solutions feel more substantial than a dialogue option and a successful dice roll. But maybe I'm asking for too much here. 
The designers of Tides of Numenera set out to create a game that acknowledges that, as humans, our knowledge is necessarily incomplete. The characters in this setting live with constant reminders that they inhabit a world both older and stranger than they could ever know, as they carry out their lives in the ruins of civilizations that have risen and fallen over eons. In a world like this, where the very landscape is infused with the accumulated debris of a billion years, every artifact you find is a window into the time that created it, the culture that brought it into being and necessitated its existence. In such a world, every action is layered with mystery. You are a child playing with toys you don't understand, a wanderer in a world filled with things both wondrous and terrifying. The systems of Tides of New Era coalesce to form an experience where the goal is not to give the player a challenge they can overcome and win as you see in so many other games, but rather to act as a background to the setting and the characters, gently nudging the player towards a state where they start to wonder what their own decisions might be like in a world like this. This isn't to say that these systems are without flaw, but rather that their intentions differ from what you see in a lot of other games. Where other RPGs feel like they approach the simulation of a character in their world by layering intricate systems of combat, magic, and crafting, Tides of Numenera simulates a world first through theme, atmosphere, and narrative, and asks you to be a character within it. The narrative state in Tides of Numenera is in how you, and by extension your character, relate to the world around you, what you feel about your party members and the time you've spent together, the things that you've learned in your journey through space and time, the legacy that you want to leave behind. The constraints that define this state are your actions. With every decision you make, your character gains another facet, another detail to anchor them to this setting, and the consequences of that decision reverberate outwards in the world to affect other people, and your understanding of what it means to be a part of this world deepens. In this sense, I think Tides does as good a job, if not better, than its predecessor. In conclusion, despite its flaws, Tides of Numenera is one of the most imaginative works of art that I have ever seen. And the reason for this, I think, has its roots in a wider phenomenon that affects the landscape of all media. I don't know if it's just me, but settings in all kinds of works, be they books, movies, video games, or TV shows in the past decade, seem to have become less exotic and diverse if anything, with many seeking to play it safe with their world building by spinning off existing visual and narrative metaphors, leading to situations like why all cyberpunk has to look like Blade Runner and all fantasy novels have to be young adult, grimdark, or Tolkien-esque to get a publishing deal. This is obviously cherry picking the data, and is a far deeper issue than I could possibly address, but I do know one thing for certain. It's been a very long time since a game world has ever managed to connect with me on an emotional level like this one does. Seeing glimpses into a wider world that you can only ever imagine in its totality makes for a world that, above all things, is enigmatic and shrouded in ambiguity. Every time I think about this game, I can't help but be amazed by how they managed to convey so much about what it feels like truly is a massive world using just scraps of flavor text and clever environmental design. It is my parting opinion that, when you're playing Tides, you're completely immersed in a universe that feels like it stretches a lot farther than the edges of the screen, and that feeling is just magical. It feels like playing Morrowind or Planescape for the first time, and those are words I never expected to say ever again. That'll do it for this video. I hope that it gave you something to think about, and I'd like to hear what your thoughts are regarding the comparison between Tides and Planescape and what you felt each game did better, or just what you think about what I said in this video. If you think I might be onto something with all this nattering on about constraints and horizons, maybe give the video a like and a subscribe, because I intend on doing more videos to further flesh out this concept. Thanks for watching. In loving memory of my grandfather, he's responsible for who I am today and my love of video games. He was the best man in the world and he's dearly missed. Rest in peace, Tucker.